Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for our webinar, Delaware Law Year in Review and CTA Developments. My name is Peter Murphy. I'm a partner in Saul Ewing's Transactional Department. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues from our Wilmington, Delaware office, Gary Lipkin. Uh, Gary is a partner in Saul Ewing's litigation department. Gary represents companies in corporate and commercial litigation matters before the Delaware Court of Chancery. Gary regularly handles shareholder and derivative actions, M&A uh, disputes, breaches of partnership and LLC operating agreements, uh, just to name a few. Also with me is Matt Gerber. Matt is a senior associate in Saul Ewing's transactional department. Matt regularly counsels clients in general corporate and alternative entity matters and Delaware corporate law, including issues of corporate governance, and also handles real estate transactions, including acquisitions, dispositions, and purchase and sale agreements. Matt is also a member of the firm's CTA team, where he helps clients with Corporate Transparency Act analysis and compliance. So before we begin, there are a few housekeeping announcements I'd like to make. Um, this webinar will feature a Q&A function. Questions can be submitted through the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're going to do our best to try to answer all the questions submitted during the webinar. Um, however, it's possible we could run out of time and we may need to follow up individually with, with specific questions. Uh, this program has been approved for one substantive CLE credit in Delaware, Florida, Illinois, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island, and there are applications pending with California and Virginia. As a CLE provider, uh, we must be able to verify your attendance. So, therefore, at random points during the uh, webinar, there will be displayed uh, and we will verbally announce um, two numeric reporting codes um, that you have to take down and report back when using uh, the automatically in the browser uh, when you complete the program, there'll be an opportunity to do that. Um, so we'll in turn send you your certificate of attendance once we receive those survey um, responses. So please be sure to um, respond to the Saul Ewing CLE survey with those codes within five days of the program. Um, following the webinar, you'll receive an email that will include a, um, separate links to the recording of this uh, webinar and also to the presentation materials. Finally, the ubiquitous legal disclaimer, the provision and receipt of information in this program is A, not legal advice, B, does not create a lawyer-client relationship, and C, should not be acted upon without seeking professional counsel um, who have been informed of the specific facts. So with that aside, um, let's begin. And I will turn it over to Matt Gerber for our first segment. Perfect, thanks, Peter. Um, so the first segment here I'm gonna go through is specifically statutory updates in Delaware in 2023. Um, Matty, next slide, please. Um, just for some background, each year, as many of you may know, Delaware typically amends each of its corporate law statutes, which include the Delaware General Corporation Law or the DGCL, as well as the Alternative Entity Acts for LLCs and partnerships. Um, the process each year involves various stakeholders, including the Delaware State Bar Association, and they come up with proposed amendments each year, kind of earlier in the year, um, which get proposed and are publicly available. And then the goal is, with those amendments each year, is to kind of keep Delaware at the forefront in corporate law. Um, correcting any ambiguities and just kind of making sure Delaware, um, it, you know, is kind of always up to date. Um, typically, the Delaware legislature will pass um, corporate law amendments during its annual session each year, and the governor typically signs them into law in the summer. So it's an annual process, um, and the, the updates today are just for 2023. Um, the amendments for this year were effective as of August 1st uh, of this year. Uh, next slide. Um, so first, we're going to start with updates to the DGCL. And, and just to clarify, this is, uh, today's presentation is not exhaustive of all updates on the statutory side, but really just the more material ones. Um, there are many updates each year, several of which are just sort of clarifying in nature. Um, but these are the larger ones that may be most relevant um, to things that you encounter in your practice. Um, the first amendment to the DGCL of note this year related to ratification of defective corporate acts. Um, so section 204 of the DGCL already provided a procedure to ratify defective corporate action, 
Um, so say, for example, a corporation issued stock improperly um, and didn't get proper approvals, you can use Section 204 to ratify it after the fact. But a general complaint that a lot of people um, practicing in Delaware had was that the process was cumbersome and expensive. Um, and you typically had to file what was called a certificate of validation with the Delaware Secretary of State um, with a lot of detailed information about the exact specifics of the action that was taken improperly and was now being ratified. And in many cases, you'd have to file more information after the fact during ratification than you would have had to initially. Um, so the amendments that were passed in 2023 really streamlined the process in two ways. Um, first, they reduced the amount of information that you have to input in a certificate of validation if you are filing one. And secondly, they only require one to be filed if the DGCL otherwise would have required it anyway. So for example, if you were doing a merger and you would have had to file a certificate of merger that you didn't properly file, you can't get out of filing that actual certificate um, by ratifying. You kind of still need this validation and, and filing what you should have filed from the start. Um, so that's the update on ratification. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the next large amendment was related to an insolvency exception in the case of asset sales. Um, so Section 271 of the DGCL generally states that for a sale of all or, or substantially all of a corporation's assets, um, you need stockholder approval. But for a long time, practitioners in Delaware have sort of debated whether there is an insolvency exception um, and, and through kind of common law that allows, in the case of an insolvent corporation, to skip stockholder approval. Um, last year in 2022, in a case called Stream TV Networks versus C Cubic, the Delaware Supreme Court kind of settled this question for um, finally and, and held that there is no general insolvency exception. Um, so in this year's amendments, there was sort of a decision made to sort of address this. And in response, there was a new or an amendment to Section 272B of the DGCL, um, where essentially it doesn't override the Supreme Court opinion, but it establishes a limited safe harbor in certain cases where insolvent corporations can now kind of sell mortgaged or, mortgaged or pledged assets and not have stockholder approval. So it's kind of creating a limited insolvency exception. Um, next slide. Uh, so the amendment um, basically permits certain sales of mortgage or pledged assets without stockholder approval. And, and they typically kind of would fall into two buckets. It's typically addressing situations like a foreclosure or a third party sale um, when a corporation's insolvent. So essentially, if a secured party has a right um, to engage in this sort of transaction and exercises that right, such as a foreclosure, it doesn't need stockholder approval. And then secondly, um, if the board of directors of the corporation authorizes a sale transaction, um, it is now allowed without stockholder approval, essentially if the value of the property to be disposed of doesn't exceed the amount of liability being reduced. So essentially, let's say a property is worth a million dollars um, and has a $500,000 mortgage on it that's being um, eliminated through the transaction, uh, that's fine, but you couldn't can't kind of couldn't do it in the reverse where you're actually the liability you're eliminating is larger than the value, or, or sorry, it's um, I think I may have said that backwards. Um, basically, the it should be the opposite. Essentially, if the property is worth five hundred thousand and you had a million dollar mortgage being discharged, that's totally fine. You're kind of getting rid of a liability larger than the value of the asset, but it can't be in the reverse where you're um, you're in the reverse situation. Um, but basically, this this exception again is kind of limited. It's sort of only looking at and specific insolvency situations related to um, kind of pledged or mortgage assets. And, and one thing to note is that this, this will apply even if your certificate of incorporation expressly would require stockholder approval for these types of sales. And going forward, a corporation must opt out of this new section, even if it already had language that you kind of broadly think would have um, covered it. Uh, next slide. Um, first thing to point out on this slide, we do have our first CLE code of the presentation. Um, so please write this one down. The code is 39521. This is the first code you will need to input um, at the end of the presentation for CLE credit. Um, but the next amendment uh, of note in the DGCL this year is related to authorizing stock splits and changes in authorized shares of corporations. So the DGCL has always provided that certain amendments to a certificate of incorporation do not require stockholder approval. And a new section 242D creates additional categories that fall under that, um, that area where you don't need the stockholder approval or, or otherwise kind of lower the threshold. So in one case, um, under the new section, in the case of a forward stock split, so in the case of where you're dividing your number of shares into a greater number, so you have 50 and now you're dividing into 100, you don't need stockholder approval um, to do the stock split or increase the number of authorized shares of the corporation to do it. 
as long as you only have one class of outstanding stock and you're not, you don't have different series of stock. So that's one example of where there's no stockholder approval required, kind of specific to forward stock splits. Uh, next slide. And on the other side, um, reverse stock splits, so where you're taking your number of shares and making it into a smaller number, um, or if you're just making a general change in your authorized number of shares um, that's not related to a forward stock split, the um, DGCL change kind of lowers the stockholder vote now from a majority of all shares entitled to vote down to a majority of all shares that actually cast a vote. Um, and the general change there is that no longer does stockholders who abstain from a vote um, influence the outcome of, of a vote on uh, these types of things. Um, this really, and this only applies to a corporation with stock on a national securities exchange generally. Um, the, the really the reason this was kind of put into effect is because there was a lot of um, situations coming up where spe specifically in the context of IPOs, corporations were finding there was just a general sort of apathy um, in stockholder in stockholders, and they're seeing less and less stockholders actually um, participating in votes on things like IPOs, and we're finding they were not able to get the votes they needed, not because there was a major objection, but just because there were so many abstentions. So this was kind of passed in, in reaction to that to kind of say, we're only going to look at the votes actually cast on these types of things um, and determining whether the necessary stockholder approval was received. And then again here, similar to the last thing we talked about, this, um, you can still have require a general majority of shares outstanding vote, but again, it has to be in your certificate of incorporation and you really need to opt out of this new provision or else uh, we're kind of lowering the vote standard down to votes actually cast versus all, all votes outstanding. Uh, next slide. Uh, the next amendments to the GGCL worth um, of note this year were to Section 228 related to stockholder notice. So the amendments here simplified um, kind of just how you determine record date for the stockholders that would have been entitled to vote if stockholders take an action by written consent. So essentially under the uh, amended 228E, um, notice of any action by of stockholders by written consent would have to be given to someone who was a stockholder as of the record date for the action that was taken, and someone who would have been entitled to notice if it had been taken at a meeting rather than by written consent. Um, and generally, you're just sending these to people who didn't consent. So if you didn't consent to an action as a stockholder and you would have had the ability to vote if it were done at a meeting, uh, you are, uh, you know, you would get or entitled to notice of a stockholder action by written consent. Um, and finally, any notice that constitutes internet availability of proxy materials under the Securities Exchange Act is now also sufficient um, in terms of notice, the form of notice and notice provisions under 228E. Um, and that's the final one from the DGCL. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then on the other side of alternative entity acts, um, the amendments on the alternative entity side were much less um, significant this year. Uh, it kind of depends year to year. Some years we see a lot more action on the alternative entity side. This year was a lot more on the DGCL and corporation side. Um, but it's kind of four items worth noting on the alternative entity side. First, um, any amendment to an operating agreement or partnership agreement that's made in connection with a merger, um, it's clarified now that, that the amendments to that operating agreement only applies to the surviving entity, not to the entity that's not survived, which is pretty self pretty self explanatory, but that's now kind of codified into the alternative alternative entity acts. Um, secondly, for a period of six years now, following the effective date of a division of an LLC or LP. Um, there is a requirement to fire, file a certificate of amendment to the certificate of division with the state if there's a change in the business address of um, the contact from the division or the place where the plan of division is being kept. Third, um, related to a protected series or registered series, um, if you um, if a if a LLC or a partnership um, determines to terminate a protected series or dissolve a registered series. Um, there is the ability to revoke that termination if you haven't yet filed a certificate of cancellation with the state, um, unless your operating agreement or partnership agreement otherwise prohibits it. But you do have kind of an option to revoke that um, that may not that wasn't express, expressly there before. And finally, um, it was also added to the, um, the alternative entity acts that a subscription for an LLC interest or a partnership interest can be irrev irrevocable as long as the subscription itself states states as such. So. Um, that's kind of the final amendment that we had on the LLC, on the alternative entity side um, that was kind of more significant this year. And with that, I think that covers everything we had for statutory updates. And I will turn it over to Gary um, for case law updates. Thanks, Matt. Gary, the floor is yours. <laughs> 
All right, I figured out how to get my video back going and unmute, hopefully. So let's do this again. I'm uh, Gary Lipkin, a partner in uh, Saul Ewing's Wilmington office, practice primarily in corporate and commercial litigation. Be discussing some of the interesting cases we saw come out of the Court of Chancery this year. And the first one to discuss is Anderson versus Magellan Health Incorporated. Uh, this case involves mootness fees and is part of a continuing effort by the Court of Chancery to cut down on what, I, what I'll call unnecessary litigation. Um, so why is this case important? The court reaffirmed um, earlier case law which abandoned the granting of mootness fee awards where supplemental disclosures were merely helpful and reaffirmed that mootness fees will really only be granted for where it um, where the litigation causes uh, the company to issue plainly material disclosures. So how do mootness fees come about? How does this issue come up? So what what usually happens here is in the context of a merger, um, a company will seek proxies from the shareholders and with that will serve um, disclosures that are given to the shareholders. Um, what we always see, even, you know, even if the disclosures were valid or maybe not perfect, um, someone's going to challenge, <laughs> someone's going to challenge the sufficiency of the disclosures and will seek to enjoin the transaction. A lawsuit would be filed. And what the Court of Chancery kept seeing is you'd have this pattern and the company, rather than fight, to litigate um, over, you know, spend tons of resources and delay the transaction, but simply issue supplemental disclosures, the sort of which the plaintiff was seeking, and the plaintiff would ultimately then dismiss the action. Um, the plaintiff would also then typically seek millions of dollars in mootness fees um, arguing that the uh, supplemental disclosures were helpful. Um, next slide here. So in this case, um, Centene Corporation agreed to ag acquire Magellan Health in January of 2021. This was part of an earlier sales process that um, was conducted in 2019. And as part of this process, there was a bunch of bidders, 24 of them, entered into an auction style bidding, um, which contained a lot of confidentiality agreements. And the confidentiality agreements contained what are known as don't ask, don't waive provisions. Um, these confidentiality agreements contain standstill provisions that obligated any potential acquirer or the bidders to refrain from taking actions that relate to acquisition or control of the target. Um, the don't ask, don't waive provisions prohibit um, potential acquirers or bidders from making any public or private requests to waive the standstill uh, restrictions. Some of these restrictions might include things such as not making any disparaging uh, comments about company management, not trying to buy up stock because these things could affect, you know, um, just the price the company might be able to get from other bidders. And, you know, that's that's the theory behind them. So here the plaintiff shareholder claimed that the don't ask, don't waive provisions and the confidentiality provisions as a whole impeded the process that led to the Centene deal. And because those provisions weren't fully described in the proxy and disclosures, it rendered them um, materially um, deficient. I think the, the theory, um, part of the theory about getting rid of the uh, don't ask, don't waive provisions is that it puts the bidders kind of in a what we can call a cone of silence. 
where they don't know what anyone else is bidding and they're not really allowed to ask. And it's designed to just get the last best offer from bidders. Um, but I think the plaintiff here was saying by going this route, um, you're not letting potential bidders up each other. So that that was the claim. Um, next slide. So here, following the pattern uh, we discussed, uh, the plaintiff filed suit seeking to enjoin the acquisition, claiming that the board's disclosures didn't sufficiently disclose the confidentiality agreement or the provisions, plaintiff felt these provisions could have affected the sales price. A mere 10 days after initiation of the suit, uh, the company issued supplemental disclosures providing further detail on the confidentiality agreements, even release some of the companies from them, um, made supplemental disclosures and um, the plaintiff ultimately agreed that these actions mooted his claim. There wasn't any discovery. I mean, like I said, these disclosures were made 10 days after the initiation of the suit. Following the disclosures, um, no other bidders emerged. So as a practical matter, as a factual matter, it doesn't seem like this litigation actually caused any substantial corporate benefit to the shareholders. There wasn't an increased bid by anybody. But in any event, the plaintiff asked for $1.1 million in a mootness fee. Next slide. What happened? The court awarded $75,000 instead of the $1.1 million sought. And in doing so, reaffirmed earlier case law um, which basically said that waivers and disclosures that were merely helpful but not materially significant do not get a higher fee. Um, here, the court essentially found the litigation did not result in more money to the company. It's not that that's the only factor the court considers, and the court has awarded um, fees, even where, you know, the corporate benefit, e even in don't ask, just getting rid of don't ask, don't tell provisions that may not have uh, ended up getting the company tons of money. But the court reiterated that the primary factor when considering um, awarding fees is the benefit to the company. And here, there just wasn't any evidence that these supplemental disclosures actually benefited um, the company. So again, it was a shift from helpful to plainly material. Uh, next slide. This again is part of a broader effort to curb excessive M&A um, litigation where the merger would be announced, proxy sought, lawsuit filed regardless of whether the disclosures provided by the company were sufficient or not. A lawsuit is inevitably filed uh, for a breach of fiduciary duty and seeking to block the suit. It's just a pattern where companies then settle and issue supplemental disclosures and mooting the litigation. Shareholder would then seek fees for merely helpful disclosures the intention here, it's an extremely busy court, as I think everyone knows, it's to discourage meritless m and litigation. There's certainly an emphasis on higher scrutiny, and it's definitely a signal for potential plaintiffs and attorneys uh, not to bring cases that won't result in disclosures that are, you know, really significant. Uh, next slide. Uh, next case to discuss is Inroy Oracle Corporation derivative litigation. Um, why is this case important? Well, it, it provides a kind of a roadmap for conservating deals where there's a fiduciary on both sides of the transaction. Here, the court ended up blessing what um, the company did. And so I think it's worthwhile to just look at the process that was followed. I think it provides a good roadmap to transactional um, 
attorneys and corporate boards to see, you know, how to go about um, acquisitions, particularly, again, where there is a fiduciary on both sides. And the court here said that where um, there is a potential for a controller on both sides um, of a transaction, so that's not necessarily enough to apply an entire fairness which is a very high standard in a merger transaction, as long as the company follows a really thorough process. So the plaintiff shareholders in this case um, alleged that Oracle acquired a company NetSuite and they overpaid for it because this was due to Larry Ellison's conflict of interest. Larry Ellison's a well-known tech guy. He's the founder, director, um, and an officer of Oracle. I think at the time of this filing, he was the C uh, chief technical officer, formerly was the CEO. He owned about 28% of the stock of Oracle and about 47% uh, stockholder of NetSuite. And the plaintiff said, you overpaid for NetSuite because Larry Ellison is controlling this and you know, he owns so much of NetSuite and it just was a great deal for him. Next slide. So the court discussed uh, the legal standard for controller status. And that um, even a minority stockholder, because in this case, um, Larry Ellison only owned less than 30% of the stock, but that didn't stop him from necessarily being deemed a controller if they exercise voting and or you know managerial power equivalent to majority control. And this isn't just general control of the corporation, it could be specific control over the transaction. So just because Larry Ellison was not the CEO and because he was only one board member and only held less than 30% of the stock, it's still possible he could be deemed a controller. Um, but, the court noted that this transaction would still be governed by the business judgment rule and not the very high standard of entire fairness unless the plaintiff's shareholders could show that Ellison was a controller on both sides of the deal or that Ellison misled the independent committee uh, and or the board. Here again, uh, the court noted that Ellison didn't have hard control. He didn't own um, a majority of the stock and he also was not the CEO. Next slide. And the process, the key elements of this transaction, which the court really approved of, and this is where I think it's a roadmap of how to do it correctly. Um, the whole process, this transaction was controlled by an independent special committee. Ellison was completely recused on both sides. Uh, the court found that he strictly adhered to the rules of recusal, most importantly. Um, he was barred from discussing the transaction at all with anyone, uh, had no involvement with the committee, nor Oracle employees who were involved in negotiations only under the committee direction and were fully informed of Ellison's recusals. There was no fact showing that any of this um, any of the, the aspects of this transaction or these steps um, were not followed. Uh, next slide. So what are the takeaways? Again, if you have a controller or somebody, not necessarily a controller, but you know someone who is a, potentially a controller who shareholders of the uh, acquiring company might suspect uh, that there's somebody pulling the strings on both sides of the transaction here. Um, takeaway is using an, uh, an independent committee to effectively handle the potential conflicts of interest is really important. It's crucial in managing transactions with not just uh, parties that actually have a majority of the stock or the CEO, but even with potential controlling parties. And most critically, adherence to the recusal is, is key to maintaining 
integrity and fairness in the transaction, then here um, the court found that Oracle was doing just that. So this, again, is a good roadmap. I think if you are a uh, transactional attorney and wanting to provide guidance to a board seeking uh, a similar transaction, this would definitely be a case to review. And uh, this litigation went on forever, but you look at this case and you know see exactly what was followed. And this is just a, a perfect roadmap to navigating how to get past this issue without uh, implicating entire fairness. Uh, next slide. Uh, next case is Milholland versus Live Venture. Uh, this case isn't groundbreaking by any means, but it's just a reminder that um, an exclusive forum clause in a merger agreement, you know, two parties to a merger agreement can say, we're going to hear any dispute in Chantry Court. Well, that doesn't necessarily convey Chantry Court um, jurisdiction. So here the plaintiff alleged in the context of a merger agreement that the buyer failed to make these timely payments to former stockholders after the transaction. Plaintiff brought suit in Chantry Court saying, well, there's a form selection clause there um, that gives jurisdiction. Next slide. Court ultimately held it lacked jurisdiction and here, the um, Court of Chancery's jurisdiction is limited to cases, unlike our Superior Court of Delaware, which implicates uh, cases just purely involving legal claims, typically just money. Here, the Court of Chancery is limited to cases involving equitable rights and remedies, equitable rights such as, I mean, the classic one is uh, breach of fiduciary duty, or again, e uh, equitable remedies, uh, the one the most common one would be some form of an, an injunction. So you need to be seeking one of those things unless there's some statutory grant that provides jurisdiction in the court of chancery. A typical breach of contract claim seeking money damages alone, like you see in you know, the typical earn out case is, is outside the court of chancery's jurisdiction um, unless, and we'll go to the next slide, unless um, at least one of the parties is the Delaware Corporation. And that that was the rub here. Uh, Eight Delaware section, uh, eight Delaware Code section 111 of the DGCL does grant the Court of Chancery jurisdiction to hear matters involving the interpretation, enforceability, or validity of merger agreements, uh, stock agreements, even if the matter is just seeking money. But this was the problem for the uh, parties to this dispute. Neither of them were Delaware companies, and they. Um, the court here held that, you know, this section that nobody's seeking an equitable right, nobody's seeking an equitable remedy, you're only seeking money. And while there is a, a statute that permits the court to hear this sort of disputes only for Delaware corporations. So just something to keep in mind for practitioners, uh, if you're involving, um, Delaware company, it, it it probably won't be a problem to put um, choice of forum and some <clears throat> some sort of share purchase agreement or merger agreement for a chance to be a fine place to hear it. But again, just make sure that <laughs> the companies are Delaware companies or at least one of them, or the court's not going to have jurisdiction to hear it. Next slide. In Re New World or New World Energy Holdings LLC. Um, this case is important to me, if no one else, because I actually had this issue come up and found this case um, interesting. I think one of the time I I looked at it, this this case had not 
decision had not been issued. So it, it it's somewhat interesting to me, if nothing else. But here, if no one else, but here the court held that statutory dissolution claims of a Delaware LLC are arbitrable. And a lot of people have questions as to whether, you know, claims just relating to, you know, statutory claims, um, such as dissolution, whether they can only be heard in court or whether they can be arbitrated. Uh, clearly, the answer is they can be arbitrated. Um, here, the LLC agreement in question contained an arbitration clause um, that permitted arbitration for all disputes relating to the LLC. Um, court held that this includes claims for statutory dissolution. And that was even where there was, as here, the LLC agreement accepted claims from arbitration where there were requests for equitable relief. Court held that this did not apply to statutory dissolution requests. Um, so you might see this, uh, I, I, I've seen this in the context where one side brings uh, an arbitration claim uh, you know, one member might bring an arbitration claim against a manager or claiming breach of fiduciary duty, breach of contract. The manager is so fed up, it's a small company, maybe a two-person member team, and just says, you know what, I'm going to court to dissolve the, uh, the company. We're at a deadlock. Well, not so fast, because even the arbitration panel could hear um, statutory dissolution claims. So just keep this in mind when drafting ADR provisions relating to LLC agreements. Next slide. Next case is Simeon versus Walt Disney Company. Um, this one was a little interesting. It, it involved the Disney stockholders to demand um, to inspect Disney's books and records relating to its uh, stated opposition to what was known as Florida's Don't Say Gay Law, which received so much press, and you've probably all heard about this. Um, Disney's public opposition led to alleged retaliation by Florida's government, including changes to the district uh, that housed Disney, the Reedy Creek Improvement District. Next slide. Um, Disney responded to the stockholders demand by providing documents on certain corporate policies and board level decisions, but declined to produce uh, certain director independence questionnaires and email communications, which are usually much harder to get than other documents anyway. Stockholder ultimately sued in the court of chancery for um, to get further documents. Next slide. So what happened? The Court of Chancery ultimately rejected the, the lawsuit on multiple grounds. First, interestingly, you don't see this one that often, uh, the court noted that the stated purpose was not really the stockholders and that it was a third party. Court found that the, the purpose for infle uh, inspection reflected the agenda of the stockholders council and not the stockholder himself. The stockholder was approached just, uh, you know, he's a guy that owned Disney stock, so they approached him. Uh, he was solicited by an attorney at the Thomas More Society, who uh, I suppose uh, opposed Disney's stance relating to the Don't Say Gay law and wanted to see if Disney breaches fiduciary duties. The stockholder apparently just wanted to know who ultimately made the decision at Disney to oppose the Florida law. Next slide. Um, more important um, for, you know, books and records actions going forward, because I see this is going to be an issue that's going to have a lot of litigation in the future, that um, the court held there wasn't a proper purpose for the inspection demand that even when investigating corporate wrongdoing, um, which is usually a proper purpose, merely disagreeing with a board's business decision does not constitute evidence of wrongdoing warranting um, an inspection. And here the court emphasized that 
A board's decision on public policy issues are legitimate business judgments. It's not that the board shouldn't consider any backlash to taking a public stance on something, but it's just one thing they have to consider. And as long as they did so reasonably, they're going to be afforded the business judgment rule um, that taking positions, uh, public positions on political issues is going to be treated like any other business decisions. Uh, next slide. So um, again, this decision underscores the importance of a stockholder's purpose in seeking um, corporate records. Uh, you have to go beyond just disagreeing with the business decision to actually be able to allege a breach of fiduciary duty. Um, it, it's I, I think this case is interesting or at least notable because I think we might see more of it and that companies these days are constantly asked to take sides on issues that are always divisive to some people and then even even where they're trying to avoid these landmines even refraining from taking a stand on issues that are divisive could could cause controversy but Ultimately, uh, as the court noted, this there's nothing special about decisions relating to public statements about certain matters of the day. And this is going to come down to business judgment. You're not going to, you know, be able to just say that these types of pronouncements, like what Disney did here, was corporate wrongdoing um, in an effort to get further records. Uh, next slide. Um, next case is in Ray McDonald's Corporation shareholders uh, driven litigation. This is one of the most important cases that came out in Delaware this year because uh, this here, uh, Vice Chancellor Lester issued a ruling uh, saying for the first time that corporate officers owe oversight duties akin to those directors under Caremark. We always knew that directors owed a, a duty of oversight. We didn't know. Well, it was unclear whether officers did. And Vice Chancellor Laster here um, rejected the argument they didn't and reaffirmed that they did, uh, which includes establishing information systems, responding to red flags, at least within the domain of their responsibility. So what does that mean? It means that, you know, a, a CFO is going to have a duty of oversight, but at least relating to financial um, issues, you know, the core, uh, a CFO should have some system to be able to identify issues. And if the CFO sees red flags, um, relating to some of these issues, the CFO may have an obligation to do something about it. Um, the CEO, um, a, a CFO in this example, wouldn't be responsible for HR issues. So, um, but, you know, at least with respect to, you know, issues falling under its responsibility that the uh, Caremark or that the, uh, yeah, the, the care more duty of oversight is going to apply to uh, officers. Next uh, slide here. Um, I think the, the takeaway here, just the allegations in this case involve pervasive sexual harassment at the company. Um, the global chief people officer um, was accused of ignoring these red flags and engaging in harassment. I'm not laughing at um, the allegations here. I'm just noting the time and that I'm hoping I'm, I'm going to leave Peter some time to uh, get into his discussion um, and try to move a little quicker. Um, uh, next slide. The court noted that the derivative nature of oversight claims, they are Oversight claims against officers are derivative, meaning the board is going to control them unless, uh, you know, a shareholder can show demand futility or wrongful refusal uh, is demonstrated. And that allegations of sexual harassment by an officer could constitute a breach of the duty of loyalty as such actions are disloyal to the company. Um, they also... It actually also could implicate a, a breach of the duty of um, care because uh, 
if you have a system of oversight and you're just not using it or you don't have a system at all, that could be, you know, a breach of the duty of care as well. Next slide. So basically this clarifies the oversight responsibility of corporate officers, uh, it underscores that they need to maintain corporate ethics and compliance within their areas of control. Uh, corporate uh, officers are going to need to be proactive and in compliance with their roles and ethics. Next slide. Uh, last case I think I want to talk about today uh, is Archkey Intermediate Holdings versus Mona. Uh, it seems like every other case in the Court of Chantry these days involves a dispute uh, it, it involves some sort of merger acquisition where there is a, uh, a dispute about whether a certain provision relates to an independent expert or an arbitration. This is another one of those um, cases. Uh, this case provides further guidance on distinguishing between an independent expert or an accountant uh, compared with an arbitration. And Again, this is something we routinely see in the Court of Chancery. Next slide. So the court, the issue here was that there was a clause, both sides disagreed with what it was. It related to a true up mechanism following a merger where there's um, certain payments that needed to be made once the books were reconciled. Um, the process required the parties to go see an independent expert, which was an accountant. However, it actually used the term arbitration, making it a little more confusing. Arbitration, the court noted, more formal process akin to a judicial proceeding. Um, expert determination is typically just, you know, more of a bean counter thing where they're just adding up numbers and figuring out what's correct. Arbitrators can usually make legal decisions. Independent accountants cannot. Um, next slide. Here, uh, Vice Chancellor Lester ruled the mechanism in the SPA was an expert determination, even though it said you know, it did use the term arbitrate. Um, it's important to look beyond the terms used to see what was intended and just look at the overall issue to be resolved. And here it had to do with, you know, a true up mechanism where, you know, the parties are trying to reconcile what money should be owed or not owed um, following a closing of an acquisition. Court provided some guidance on interpreting past practices and gap compliance and noted that these are things that an independent expert is fully capable of handling. Um, and so left it to them. Next slide. Uh, again, this case serves as a cautionary tale for a transactional lawyer to just define, uh, you know, in this for providing for dispute resolution, really clarifying how you want it handled, be precise in your language uh, regarding arbitration or not, uh, to, to avoid unintended legal interpretations. And for corporate litigation practitioners, it's a reminder that even if a dispute resolution clause is not a bona fide um, arbitration clause, it doesn't mean you can't seek to stay the litigation. To have the independent expert proceeding go forward, as I, I'm seeing this in numerous cases that I have going on right now, um, where this happens, where one side wants to go forward in court and the other says, no, nah, it says not so fast. We have an independent accountant proceeding that has to go forward in the first instance. Um, so that's just something to take away from a litigation perspective. And I think that's all I have, Peter. If I left you any time left, how about it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no worries, Gary. Now, uh, luckily, I think I'm up to the challenge here. So, um, hey, everybody. Um, I wanted to take a minute, although this isn't, you know, Delaware specific, it's federal. Um, the Corporate Transparency Act takes effect January 1st. So it's important to um, at least discuss, you know, how it's going to impact um, entities, for, both foreign and domestic. So next slide. 
All right. I like to say, you know, before we get into any of the nuances, which we may or may not have time for, the whole point of the Corporate Transparency Act is the federal government wants to start connecting human beings, you know, people with a pulse to every entity that's formed or registered in the U.S. So the de definition the act uses is, um, or the terms the act uses are, the CTA requires all reporting companies to identify their beneficial owners and their company applicants. Each, each of those three things has its very specific definition. And while some cases might be really straightforward, it's a single member LLC um, and the individual created the entity on their own by filing something, others are gonna be much more complicated um, and will require us um, legal analysis and, and a recommendation from counsel. Next slide. So real quickly, I'll, I'll go over these. The CTA is part of the broader anti-money laundering, counter-terrorism financing uh, framework. Um, it's something that exists in other countries, and it was really you know, a matter of time before it got brought to the U.S. Really what FinCEN, uh, a bureau within the U.S. Treasury, is creating is a master database of beneficial ownership information connecting entities with people. Next slide. So like I just mentioned, um, the, where this database is actually, it was on the previous slide, but that's okay. We can just keep moving. But um, it's a private database. It's for, for law enforcement, intelligence, national security kind of issues. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, again, it's, it's meant to kind of bring the US to that place where Europe, Canada, other, other countries are when it comes to corporate transparency. Next slide. All right, so who needs to report? That first term, reporting companies, what are those? They are domestic and foreign companies. Um, starting with domestic, think of your corporation, your LLCs, but really any entity that files a document with the Secretary of State in that jurisdiction to be created. So that includes broader than just corporation, corporations and LLCs. So on the foreign side of it, it's the same kind of analysis, but it's a foreign company that is registered to do business in the US through the filing of something with the uh, individual secretary of state in those jurisdictions. So from that, from those definitions, we can assume that LLPs, LLP, uh, LLLPs, those things will fall under reporting company, whereas things like a sole proprietor or a general partnership would not. Next slide. So once you get through that first cut, which isn't going to exclude a whole lot of entities, you know, private trust, perhaps, and, and a few of the others, you're going to look at what are the exemptions to the CTA? What are the categories that, uh, despite being a reporting company, you don't have to file one of these beneficial owner reports? And there's 23 specific ones. Um, by and large, what you're going to find in all of them is that they come from somewhere that's already highly regulated. So the odds are, information on beneficial ownership is likely already somewhere. It's a, it, these entities are, um, you know, whether it's a bank, a credit union, it's something that they've already have a higher compliance standard. The one that I like to point out is number 21, uh, large operating company. Next slide. So large operating company is really, I think of the next big cut in, in who can we eliminate from having to do these reports. And that's going to be any company with 20 uh, or more full-time employees and over $5 million in gross receipts or sales. So one of the common questions, uh, and sorry, one last piece, it actually has to have an operating presence, a physical office in the U.S. One of the questions I've been getting is, well, what if, what if I got a multi-entity um, operation and in the aggregate, I can add all this up? So far, FinCEN is saying, no, it has to be, uh, it can't be aggregated. It has to be that entity itself meets this criteria. Next slide. So the reporting requirements, um, like the first slide I showed you, it really focuses on three areas, the reporting company, the beneficial owners, and the company applicant. Next slide. So the reporting company is going to provide pretty much the same information that we're rep reporting to states or providing to states when that entity is created. The legal name, DBA, current address, state of formation, and tax ID number. Next slide. 
here's where we actually connect that person with a pulse to the entity, right? This is what doesn't exist yet that the CTA is creating. And that's beneficial ownership information that'll be submitted through what's called a BOI report with FinCEN. That will be, if the person satisfies that definition of beneficial owner, it'll be their full legal name, their date of birth, uh, residential address, a unique identifying number, which is typically the number that comes from either your passport or a driver's license and an actual image of that document that contains the number. Next slide. So who is and isn't a beneficial owner? Um, apart from the exemption analysis, figuring out if an entity is exempt, this is the next big piece of, of analysis to find out who has to report and who doesn't. There's two ways to determine whether somebody's a beneficial owner, substantial control and um, ownership, how much they own. So uh, next slide. So when it comes to substantial control, this is broad, right? So there are some bright lines, senior officers, those uh, with authority to appoint senior officers, important decision makers, and then the, the catch-all category, any other form of substantial control. So the rules and the CTA um, really require an analysis of determining, you know, they consider the fact that there's unique structures where control might be in, in, a, in a shareholder who's a minority shareholder, but because of other provisions, they have, they have control. So it's something you'll have to look at, but the bright lines are gonna be those senior officers um, and uh, those with authority to appoint um, decision makers. Next slide, please. So the second prong of that is, is ownership interest, which is frankly what I think about when I think of beneficial ownership, it's like, all right, how much, how much do you own? And the standard is 25% or more. And Ownership interest, though, is, is interpreted broadly in the CTA. So it's not just a question of equity or stock. It can also be voting rights or they say any other mechanism or here we have any arrangement that establishes ownership rights in the reporting company. So that could be um, convertible instruments, options. Um, there is uh, it, it goes far beyond what we you know, traditionally think as membership units or, or shares. Next slide. So lastly, the company applicant. This is the individual or individuals who actually file a document to form the entity. So the rules give the classic example of, you know, an attorney in a law office has a client. They say, we want to form a new Delaware LLC um, to do this transaction. The attorney then directs uh, a staff member to actually file the paperwork that he's prepared or she's prepared and it goes to the secretary of state. So um, in that case, both the attorney and the paralegal would be considered company applicants. Why does that matter? Because they have to provide identifying information as well. Next slide. So importantly, when are these due? So this is the key for all existing entities, those that exist as of January 1st, they have a full year to submit beneficial ownership information reports. Um, so we're fielding questions from clients right now, and we're, um, you know, really looking at this in two paths. One being, hey, are those already in existence? We have this timeline to work with you to, to make sure we have compliance. The next category is, what about anything created after January 1st? Originally, it was 30 days they had to file the reports. Um, a rule was recently finalized that gives for the first year 90 days to file that report. So this is kind of like track two. We have these ongoing, every day, new entities are being created, and we, and we have like a, uh, an ongoing timeline of when they need to file these uh, beneficial ownership reports. The, the last thing is, is if there was an exemption that applied, but no longer does, once that entity is aware of that, or has reason to be aware of it, they have 30 days to file uh, a report. Next slide. And now I'm gonna move real fast. So here's where the, the the reporting goes kind of magnifies exponentially because anytime there's an update in beneficial ownership information, a new report has to be filed. An uh, entity does a transaction that changes their beneficial owners and an update has to be filed with FinCEN. Next slide. And lastly, CTA is getting a lot of attention right now because the, the penalties are um, substantial up into um, 
uh, fines of not more than $10,000 and more than two years in jail or $500 a day in civil penalties. This is all based on um, a willful failure to report or either filing fraudulent information. Okay. Uh, yes, great question. Um, and I'm getting to it now. Next slide. There it is. Okay. For your final CLE code, uh, it is 72933. Thanks everybody for uh, sticking with us. Sorry for the increased pace there at the end, but keep an eye out for a follow-up email and that'll include links to the materials and the recording. And um, if we didn't get to your question, we'll do our best to get, uh, reach out to you individually. Thanks so much.